Um, so I'd like to say thank you firstly uh, to everyone for attending tonight. Um, this is the first session that we'll be running. Those of you that don't know me, my name is John Dove. I'm a solicitor advocate at MAJ Law. And some of you may know me because I run the annual national speed mooting competition. This format is something that we normally run once a year on the day of the national speed mooting competition. We'll have a panel of practitioners and students can ask questions to the practitioners. And we find that a lot of uh, students gain a lot of um, sort of experience from speaking to these practitioners, asking questions, and it's quite valuable for them. So I thought, well, it might well be a good idea to run further sessions. And hopefully students uh, such as yourselves will be able to uh, gain an insight into life and practice. This is the first of the sessions that we're running. And this has a panel of barristers. Um, so that I'll, what I'll do now is I'll introduce you to the panelists and give each of the panelists uh, an opportunity just to say a few words about themselves and what their practice area is. Um, so the first panelist that we have is Oliver King from St. John's Buildings. Good evening, everyone. Hi, I'm Oliver King, as you've just heard. Um, I'm at St. John's Buildings in Chester, but we've got chambers um, throughout the Northwest in Manchester, Sheffield and Liverpool. Uh, I'm um, a criminal hack, so um, pretty much all my practice is crime in the Crown Court, um, doing trials, although not many recently. Um, so that's me. Yes, and next we have Jack Troop from 15 Winky Square. Hello everyone, um, as you've heard, I'm Jack Troop, uh, based in Preston, uh, 15 Winkley Square. Um, similar to Oliver, I'm a general criminal hack, um, not doing many trials at the moment. Um, I do bits and bobs of civil uh, law as well, but not a lot. Um, that's me. Uh, next we have Bernice Campbell from 7 Harrington Street. Hello, I don't know if you can hear me all the way um, I'm here to see Jack and Oliver, uh, just in crime, um, solely crime, so we'll see a little bit at the moment. I'll see if we get uh, into the group. And we have Kadeem Al Hassan from Park Square Chambers. Hi, Kadim Al Hassan. I'm uh, a criminal barrister predominantly, although I do some civil law. We have Barry Harwood from Harwood Law. Yes, hello everybody. Um, I'm uh, Barry Harwood. I'm an employment law specialist, um, set out as a sole practitioner in my own practice, um, and I'm on the Bar Council Education Training Committee and also the Equality, Diversity and Social Mobility Committee as well. And finally, Saeed Ahmed from Normanton Chambers. I am Saeed. I practice commercial law, banking and finance. Um, general things include shareholder disputes and other contractual disputes. Um, Chambers is based in London on the Strand, opposite the Royal Court of Justice. Thank you. Now this event has been organised by myself and of course with Sonny Salam. So I'd like to hand over to Sonny just to say a few words before we start. Hi everyone, um, thank you uh, for joining us today. Um, so I am a second year trainee at Baldwin Solicitors, uh, which is a West Midlands based firm. Currently on my last seat, uh, which is a split two way seat in civil litigation and employment litigation. Uh, due to qualify on the 1st of October, pandemic pending. Um, also a professional mentor where I just mentor BCU students. Um, and then part of the reason for bringing something like this was because a lot of students that I mentor were saying that they're virtual, sorry, their insight days have been cancelled. So uh, luckily John does this kind of thing a lot and um, we both thought it was a good idea to bring something like this for everyone. And, and like John said, it's a really good opportunity and valuable experience for students. So I um, hope you have a, a good session and um, I'll pass you over to John. Thank to you. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll start the session in just a moment. Just before we begin, I'd just like to set out some ground rules and explain the way it's going to work tonight. Um, so in terms of ground rules, you'll notice everybody's microphone is muted, but you do have the opportunity to take yourself off mute. The way it'll work is tonight's session will be in two parts. So firstly, we'll have some pre-prepared questions. So when you signed up, you had the opportunity to put some questions in. We have a list of those questions. So the first 40 minutes or so, will be taken up with the pre-prepared questions. In the second part of the meeting, we'll then go on to spontaneous questions. So if you think of a question on the day, you can ask. Um, there's two ways in which you can ask. You can either, um, when we're on that part of the session, pop your hand up and I can turn to you to ask a question. 
Or if you don't want to do that, you want to stay off the screen and there's the option to message. So you can simply uh, type a question uh, during the meeting. At the end of the meeting, for the last couple of minutes, we're going to have some sort of snippets of wisdom from our barristers, if I put it that way. Um, so sort of final takeaway messages. So um, without further ado, let's jump in. And the first question that we have. So the first question is, uh, for all of the barristers, uh, how do you manage or how do you find self-employed working? What are the advantages and what are the disadvantages? Um, so we'll turn to Oliver first to deal with this one. Sorry, just unmuting. Um, okay, so um, advantages. Um, you don't have a boss breathing down your neck. That's a, that's a, a great advantage. Uh, although, of course, when you go to court and you're in front of a judge, sometimes it's a, it's a bit like being in front of the headmaster at school. Um, but you're responsible for your own success, pretty much. Chambers, your clerks in chambers, will give you the introductions to solicitors, to, to solicitors firms, to individuals within those firms. And then it's for you to nurture that relationship. It might be some solicitors you don't get on with, others you really gel with. You like the sort of practice they have. If it's a niche area, um, that's something that you want to do. Uh, and then you can build that relationship and, and, and get more and more work in that area and steer yourself in that direction. So you can very much control um, you know, the, the direction of, of your, um, your career. You can control how busy you are when you're self-employed, of course. If you want to go full out, you can tell your clerks that you want to do advices, that you, you want to be in court every day, you can be busy. Um, then again, if you're someone who juggles um, other commitments, um, then you, know, you can do that. There aren't very many other employed jobs where you can do that. Um, you can also pick when you prepare for court. Um, if you're the kind of person that sort of likes a, a rigid nine to five day, you can be in court in the morning go back to chambers, prepare for your case the next day, uh, or in the afternoon play a bit of golf maybe and then get home and, uh, and then do prep for court the next day. So it's very much, time management's very much um, for, you to, for you to do. Um, so that's advantages. Disadvantages as I see them, well, you're very much, especially if you do legally aided crime like I do, you're very much at the mercy of the, uh, the government and the civil service, and they do keep changing the rules and the way we're paid, usually downward. Um, so, you know, you don't have much bargaining power when it comes to what you earn as a, as a criminal barrister. Work can be sporadic as well, so a bit, bit of a feast and famine. Sometimes you can be really, really busy, in fact, returning work. Other times it's really quiet and, and you're, you're sort of looking at your age debt thinking, you know, in a couple of months time, I'm not going to have much money coming in. Obviously in an employed job, you know what you're getting each month. Um, other disadvantages, of course, you don't get a pension. You've got to make your own pension provision if you're self-employed. You don't get sick pay. Um, you don't get maternity pay. So some of the female members of chambers, when they leave to have children, uh, they've got to fall back on savings or get back to work quickly. Um, so again, an, an, another disadvantage. But <clears throat> in my view, anyway, the the advantages far outweigh the disadvantages. Um, it's great to be able to sort of carve and shape your own career and uh, be responsible for your own success. Thank you. Quite a comprehensive answer there. Uh, Barry, do you have anything to add to that? Th thanks, for that John. Well, I mean, that was a comprehensive answer. I suppose. The advantages for me are complete, um, as a sole practitioner, complete diary control and no clerks. Um, I have a personal assistant who is also my practice director, but um, basically I employ him. So it's not quite like having a clerk. Of course, those that have lots of clerks know that there are lots of relationships and power play that go on with the clerks. And um, I'm quite fortunate that I don't have that as a sole practitioner. And so therefore I've even more freedom than um, our previous colleague had. Uh, having said that, the disadvantages are um, payment, really. Um, how regularly you're going to be paid, how quickly you're going to be paid. My practice splits around 70% public access work with the rest coming from the traditional instructions from solicitors and others, licensed access and so on. And so therefore, there can sometimes be good cash flow and poor cash flow. So that's a, that's a disadvantage because you're paying tax on money you receive as a self-employed person um, before you receive it. And sometimes the age debt, depending on people's practices, can build up quite quickly. 
Um, that's not quite like that with my practice because I do, as I say, about 70% public access. And that's a pay-as-you-go type of situation where they're paying you for each piece of work that you do. So in a sense, I'm, I'm quite fortunate. So those are two of the perhaps other advantages, disadvantages that um, our previous colleague may not have mentioned. And I'll stop there because there are others to follow. Thanks, Barry. And just finally, Benice, do you have anything uh, further to add to, to the answer? Um, but for me, the main thing was my flexibility. So that's a massive um, plus to being self-employed. I had children as I was uh, gathering my practice together and it meant that I could have some flexibility with when I saw them, when I dealt with them, when I had to take them to school, pick them up. I had some flexibility. Uh, I think what you have to be when you're self-employed more than anything is have some self-control. Uh, self-control that you don't take more time off than you need. Uh, self-control that when you suddenly get a, a check-in, you think I can buy three pairs of shoes and two handbags because you will have your tax to pay at the end of um, every six months. You'll have your chamber fees to pay. So I think you have to get very early on. You have to divide your money up and divide your time up. It's not a problem when you're self-employed to work until three four o'clock in the morning but again you've got to have that self-control that you don't work too much or vice versa if you work too little you've got a problem because that is the only money you're going to get thank you okay, there are some great answers to that first question there and we'll uh, move on to the second question now which is what is the biggest learning curve that you, you have faced on your journey to the bar and um, jack would you like to start with this one uh, yeah, I could start with that. Um, I think for me, the biggest learning curve I, I had was learning to talk to clients um, uh, because certainly doing a criminal um, practice, a lot of uh, clients that you deal with, they have their own difficulties, they aren't necessarily the most educated people um, and finding that rapport and being able to talk on a level that they will understand um, that's quite a difficult thing. I think for a lot of people when we're told um, and you're trained when you're doing your degree and, and your bar course to uh, describe things in proper terms, describe things um, with reference to case law and things of that nature, um, clients aren't able quite often to understand that and some of them aren't interested. So I think that's probably the biggest learning curve for me. Thank you. Uh, Kadim, do you have anything to add to what Jack has said? Well, I mean, the biggest learning curve that I had when, when I first started was obviously um, when you are on your second and sixth, which is the, the practicing element of your pupillage, you start off with uh, small cases and the buck effectively stops with you. And that is a, an immense responsibility and you tend to take that on. And um, it's a very steep learning curve and you learn it. Uh, and either you... Um, you know, sink or swim. That's really why the bar is such a, uh, it's, not, it's not the easiest of professions, but it's a wonderful profession to practice in. Right. And just finally, Saeed, is there anything that you found um, in terms of your learning curve when approaching the bar? I would say for me, it was um, the fact that the bar isn't an end destination. It's a journey. And throughout, you have to continually develop and uh, there are expenses all the way from uh, student days and um, my steep learning curve was most definitely managing finances making sure that um, I can continue with uh, the things that I want to do work and um, a, a sustainable uh, arrangement that I can continue to work bearing in mind what everyone else has said about the sporadic income streams, um, the feast and famine, and um, the element of self-control about overdoing it or underdoing it. And uh, yes, so finances, I think you need to have a, a, a tight rope around the, the budget. Excellent, some good advice there. Um, at this stage, I think I'll hand over to Sonny who has the third question from the students. Thanks, John. Um, so the third question is, what is more important in securing pupillage, academics or attributes? Um, Oliver, can you have a go at that one, please? Of course, yeah. Um, I think 
it depends on the sort of chambers that you want you want to get into uh, and this is where sort of researching the chambers is so important because some chambers pride themselves um, on having sort of Oxbridge graduates, starred firsts, um, other chambers look for other skills. They're, they're not so, um, you know, wound up about the, the academic side of it. So before you apply to a chambers, go on their website, have a look at their members, uh, look at their academic backgrounds, what their interests are, um, and think about what sort of chambers that you might fit into. Um, so, you know, if you've got a 2-2 from, um, you know, a, a not so um, prestigious university, but you've got loads of life experience and you've done some really interesting stuff, then um, look at those chambers that will value that. Obviously don't apply to a chambers where all the, all the tenants have got um, first class degrees from, from Oxbridge. Having said that, I, I think it, it, I, I don't want to mislead anybody. It's really competitive these days. And of course, chambers receive hundreds and hundreds of applications for pupillage, and you've got to narrow them down somehow. Um, and sometimes the only way you can do that is to have a look at um, pe people's academic qualifications as a starting point. So in, in answer to the question, I think, I think academics is, is going to always be the starting point for any chambers, but, but some it's going to be more important uh, that you've got a, a first from Oxbridge, others, you know, if you've got a 2-2, they might then look at um, what else you've done in life um, and, and place more, more weight on that. So it, it just comes back to what I said. Before you apply to a chamber, especially if you're doing it via um, the, the online application, I think you're limited, aren't you, to 12. Um, don't just cast the net wide. Really focus on the chambers, what, what the, 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 the ethos of chambers is, the character of chambers, what they stand for, um, the sort of... Um, uh, backgrounds that the members have and um, and then and then focus on those chambers that you think suit you that would be my advice thank you Oliver some great advice there uh, Kadim do you have anything that you would like to add it may well be uh, useful to have a um, an opinion from someone at the senior end of the bar sure I mean I've been practicing now for about 26 years and uh, uh, um, as uh, Oliver said academia is important if you're going into probably tax law or planning law. Um, and if you're going into uh, criminal work and the type of work that I do, um, you know, academia is relevant, but your attributes as an individual and your life skills are something that um, will play very heavily in the way that you prepare your cases, the way that you conduct your cases, and the way that you're able to relate to members of the jury. And those are skills that, um, academia on its own does not teach you so it's very important to be well-rounded and I think probably less so nowadays um, I mean we're all encouraged that you know this fitting in business is uh, uh, is not something that um, plays very heavily on chambers although the general ethos of chambers is that you are um, good at what you do and that you can be left uh, on your own and um, work with everybody else. But you don't have to be. You know, you can be your own, uh, like a lone wolf, uh, practicing in your, in your own little sphere, but you have to be able to get on with other people. Um, and you don't, you don't always get on with everybody. Uh, we all know that, but those are the things that I would say are quite important. Uh, absolutely, I mean, it is a profession where people skills are absolutely crucial. And just finally, Jack, as the person who's gone through the process uh, most recently, do you have any tips for our uh, pan uh, students today? I'm the baby face then, that's why we're uh, picking on me for this one. Um, yeah, I think attributes is, is definitely one of the most important things in the world and picking up what was said before, um, communication and people skills is so vital to the job that we do because at the end of the day you can know everything about the law you can know everything about a case but if you can't communicate that to a judge or a jury or your client even um it's completely impossible so i would if you're talking about tips um the sorts of things i did um when i was applying for people is just try to have 
and try to volunteer and have as much interaction with uh, people as possible. So I volunteered, for example, at the Citizens Advice Bureau. Um, and that meant that I was exposed to people just simply coming in off the street, asking for advice on a variety of topics. Um, and it just gets you used to talking to people. So I think that's that's one of the top tips I would suggest is gain that skill, gain the talking, and the communication skills um, and the attributes that, that come with that. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll move on to the, uh, the next question now. Uh, the next question that we've had is, in a world that's shifting more and more towards remote working, what skills uh, would the lawyer of the future require and what skills should they start developing now? Um, Saeed, would you like to start on this one? <clears throat> I think IT is um, a very important skill to have and um, the way things are looking, more and more work will be going online. Um, having the ability to use computer systems, for example, um, recently in Chambers, we've had a lot of focus on training events uh, training barristers on e-bundles and um, serving documents, just using um, a more electronic format, uh, going paperless. We have some barristers who literally print everything um, and just have never had to use their computer uh, in a courtroom. And um, I think developing those skills will be important. Being able to uh, use practitioner texts uh, electronic versions, being able to utilize them. Um, some find it easier than others. Uh, a lot of the barristers that I work with in chambers, including myself, prefer to have the hard copy and uh, we put tabs in, we highlight them. And it's just um, getting used to putting bookmarks into an electronic version of uh, a similar text. Fantastic, thank you for the answer. Uh, Benice, do you think there's anything else that the lawyer of the future or any other skills that the lawyer of the future should develop now? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. I think it was on mute for a second. That was a bit like that advert with, um, with Rashford who couldn't um, connect onto the uh, <laughs> Zoom. Um, the what I was saying was I think that most people that um, faces don't appear but are listening into this will probably know more about IT than a lot of people that are in chambers at the moment because people are being brought up with IT more than the people already established are. Anything that you can do to further yourself and, and I think Twitter at the moment is really good to link into to as many uh, CBA um, Northern Circuit anything you can think of that is connected with the law link into them at the moment because you'll be seeing how things are being dealt with within the courts at the moment zoom meetings they're not zoom but the Skype uh, and the like and in fact there's, there's gonna be new platforms brought forward is how we are going to be connected and it wouldn't surprise me if there's certainly in certain aspects of the law that everything will be done through a computer as opposed to us uh, turning up. I, I hope that's not the case with um, uh, cases in, in the courts where you need people such as juries. Uh, but I think in the future, IT skills are really important. And if you can show that you have IT skills and put that on your CV, I think that they will be very attractive to Chambers. Thank you. Uh, and Barry, do you have anything else that you would like to uh, add to this question? Yeah, I think really, um, for me, it's um, dealing mainly, well, it's an exclusively a civil practice, but it's um, client care skills. It's the ability to deal with people at all levels, whether they're employers or employees in my practice. You have to be able to relate to people. And I think this is where often, but not always, some of the students that come through the system that have had other careers or other lives before they became lawyers can often do really well and those that do the gdl in particular because they have dealt a lot more with hands-on people that isn't to say that those that have done a straight law degree can't do it do that as well because they can because it was mentioned earlier i think um by um i think it was uh yeah by jack that um people that have done work for example with cba or through or other voluntary organizations where they've helped individuals 
will be quite good at dealing with people as well. And I think that's what my clients seem to keep coming back for is because you're good at relating to them. So it's about being relatable um, and about being also reliable as well, because there are lots of lawyers out there I'm finding that um, are saying they're going to do things, but then they're not doing things. And then that lets the side down and lets chambers down and so on and so forth. So you're as good as the weakest link. So it's about being reliable and about being relatable. Great advice, Barry. Um, Sonia, do you have a, another question there to ask for the panel? Yeah, um, so question five is, do you have any advice regarding scholarships with the inns? I have an interview with Inner Temple for the GDL scholarship. Um, should we do a hands up one for this one? Does anybody yeah, want to? can do. I mean, does anyone have any um, pointers that they want to jump in with? Yeah, I'll turn to Jack first. Once again, the baby face. Uh, yeah, I'll go with this one then. Um, well, I, I actually um, was a beneficiary of a scholarship myself, so I, I sort of know a little bit about what they're going through um, in terms of the, the worry and the, the stress of, of having to go for the interview. Um, all I would suggest is um, try to stay calm. Remember that the inns are looking to give money for, to people. They're not looking to um, do you out of it or anything of that nature. So... Uh, try to relax, try to stay calm, um, and what we were saying before about communication skills, utilise those. Um, quite often, uh, if I remember rightly, I don't know the middle temple because mine was in a temple, but I think they normally have problem questions um, you'll, you'll be facing. So do a bit of reading around uh, the sorts of questions you may get asked, it's criminal law, uh, civil, and I think family law were the two uh, areas that I was asked about, um, and just Think about the answers to the normal questions that you may get asked, the similar ones that you get asked on um, your uh, pupillage applications. So why do you want to be a barrister? Um, what uh, sort of law do you want to go into? What sort of practice do you want to build? I would think about those questions and practice um, your answers, um, not to an extent where you're reading them out verbatim, um, but just so you're, you're comfortable and you know the kind of things that, that may come up and you've got easy answers accessible um, when when they come up. Thank you, Jack. Um, do we have Barry? So to you next. Oh, I think you're on mute there, Barry. You might need to take Sorry. yourself off. Can I can I just add to that? I think everything Jack has said is absolutely spot on. But one of the things that I find in this court, some of the students out that have gone for interviews, is that believe it or not, they've not actually done the basic research and learned anything about the inn or the alumni of the inn and what those individuals have done, because the inn will have everybody at every level of the legal profession, including High Court judges and Supreme Court judges, right the way down to our first tier judges, as well as other barristers with other interesting careers at the bar. And so if you're asked a question, for example, I'm from Lincoln's Inn, about Lord Denning, you would know that Lord Denning was a member of Lincoln's Inn and that he lived in the inn and those sorts of things. And I know you pick up this when you dine in, but all I would say is that use those opportunities of um, doing the dining. I know it's all virtual at the moment, but use the opportunities of networking. I think it was mentioned earlier, the Twitter networks, the LinkedIn media, all of those things where you can find out from the specialist associations, the Bar Council, the Bar Standards Board, all of these sorts of sources of information are useful to really clear yourself up with in terms of current news and developments within the profession, because you're very likely to be asked questions by the senior barristers on that committee, many of whom are benchers as well. Mm. And I think that's great advice, Barry. It's, it's incredible how much information you can glean about the legal profession simply from being on these social networks, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, you will pick up a lot, so it certainly is important to link in um, with, the, with the various legal networks out there. Um, I think we'll have time for a couple more questions before we move on to uh, questions from students. Um, so we'll just deal with a couple more. Um, next one, quite an interesting one, actually. Uh, how do you prepare to argue a case that you think will lose or when you think the legal argument is not in your favour? Do you have anyone that wants to jump in uh, with a suggested answer on this one? Uh, Barry, <laughs> turn to you again. <laughs> I, I don't mind answering it because often I get cases like that where, and it's not a question of whether you believe somebody or not because it doesn't really matter whether you believe them or not, but your heart does have to be in it. And I think sometimes the nonverbal communication can be quite telling, but you've got to go in and do the 
professional best that you possibly can. So um, you've certainly got to make sure that you support the client to the best of your ability. And it's in line with the code of conduct, isn't it? You don't want to be one of those individuals that diminishes the impression of us to the rest of the public by simply doing a job where you haven't read the papers, you haven't done a skeleton argument or you haven't done a chronology and then you go in and you do really sort of show that you're not interested. That doesn't bode well for the rest of us that then have to be perhaps against you in another case or something. Okay, fine. You, you know, but you're not doing your client any um, good service and you're not doing the profession any good service. So I think what you've got to do is always prepare, even if your heart isn't in it, you've got to really do your best for your client because at the end of the day, a tribunal in my case or a crown court jury in a criminal matter or a magistrate's court um, are going to, or a county court judge, are going to be the ones that decide on the law and the facts. Um, and then, the, of course, criminal matter, it's the, the jury for the facts and the judge directly on the law. So you've really got to do your best and you're letting everybody down, including yourself, if you don't. Mm. Yeah. Anyone else have anything to add to that? Jack? Yeah. Uh, Jack, <laughs> then, Oliver. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I, or well, the way that I um, try to deal with that sort of uh, issue is I remember or I try to tell myself that it isn't actually me that has to eventually live with the consequences of the case. It's the client. So you have to put them first in any uh, scenario that, that you are presented with, even if you think it's a no-hoper. Um, and I think the other thing to remember is sometimes strange things do happen in cases. Every single person on this panel will probably have had a case which they thought was going to go one way and it went a completely different way. I had a, a, an experience in January this year as a Crown Court trial. Um, I cross-examined the complainant and afterwards, after I would have cross-examined the complainant, if I was on the jury, I probably would have convicted my client. But in reality, we went through the rest of the case, I did my best, and actually the client was eventually acquitted. So strange things do happen, and you've got to almost put your own ego aside and present the best case you can and do um, justice by your client. Thank you, Jack. Oliver? Yeah, um, this just supplements really what um, uh, Barry and Jack have said. Um, what I'd say is always look at your audience and tailor your argument to meet your audience. So if you're, if you're arguing a technical point before a judge, um, don't patronise them, don't start telling them what the law is, uh, argue why your case is perhaps different um, to, to, to the, um, you know, the established law if, if you're trying to do that. If, if there's a legal principle and your client's case seems to look one way and you're trying to persuade the judge it should go the other, then um, you know, try and distinguish the case. Um, whereas, if your audience is a is a jury, of course, they're a bit more human. They're not as um, perhaps as um, uh, clinical as a judge might be. Um, so you can appeal more to their human side. So you might use different language. So um, always always think about who you're in front of, what your tribunal is, who your audience is, and then tailor uh, your argument um, to to meet them. Kareem, did your hand go up then as well? It, it did. Um, one thing you must never do is give up. Um, and uh, you must always try to fight your case. I mean, many people in, in the audience, uh, except some of the professional practitioners, will know that there are many QCs who are Queen's Council who are the creme de la creme, the best of the crop, uh, or um, as, as, as they like to be uh, called. They some of many of them have never won a case for, for five or ten years, but it doesn't stop them from fighting. So never give up. I think that's great advice. And I think we've all been in the position whereby you have a client and you give them advice on the way in which a case is going to go, and sometimes they just don't listen. They want their day in court, they want to fight it, come what may. And you go in and you know you're fighting a losing battle, but at the end of the day, as Barry said, you've got to put your best foot forward, put your full effort into the case. Um, but most importantly, make sure you comply with the code of conduct. I mean, I can, I can, from my own experience. I mean, I had a uh, a case, and it's not often that you 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 actually listen to your client and you say, well, well I don't think that defence is going to wash because there's there's been seven defendants in this case, all of them have pleaded guilty, the complainant has been telling the truth about what they have done because they've all pleaded. But um, are you saying that? 
he's lied about you. And he goes, well, he did lie about me. He's, he's not telling the truth about me. And, um, you know, I gave him strong advice, but he said, no, I am not going to plead guilty because I'm not guilty. And by the time I'd finished cross-examining the complainant, he finally, uh, you know, confessed that the reason he'd um, um, pinpointed my client was he didn't really help out. He wasn't involved, but he didn't help out. So don't always, um, you know, impose your view sometimes on, on clients. You, you do your best. You're there to give advice and guidance. But you've also got to listen. Absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic advice. Uh, I think we'll just go on to a, sort of one or two more questions before we move on to our audience. Uh, next one, it's similar to what we've had before, but slightly different. Um, what do you think will be the biggest changes to trials in light of coronavirus? And do you see any of these as being problematic? Do you have anyone that wants to jump in uh, on this one? Uh, so, so Barry's hand go first, and then, then we'll jump across to all of that. <clears throat> I think I'm going to say the obvious, really, which is the use of technology, because we're all now in a situation where cases, certainly in my jurisdiction, are being dealt with initially by case management and the practice direction, saying that everything that was listed um, uh, before the 26th of June is now a case management and is getting dealt with and put out for another year or so's time and getting relisted. So we are using that. And I know some practitioners in other areas, family and crime, or have other experiences where those trials are going ahead by way of technology and there are all sorts of difficulties in my view around that one of which i think primarily is the cross-examination aspect of what we do when we get into the tribunal and we need to see our witnesses face to face to cross-examine the judge and the panel certainly in my area are looking and feeling for credibility of those witnesses looking at who's to be believed and then they're attaching the weight that they think appropriate to those individual um, witnesses. And I think there's, that is all lost, I think, in some of the technology. And I think some of the students I've been talking to recently who have been also, and this is um, aligned to the same point, been doing interviews for pupillage through um, Zoom, through Team and so on, for other IT uh, methods of doing it, have found that um, di quite difficult. I think we've all seen it with some of the interviews on the TV as well, with the turn taking and the, the, the pregnant pauses and sometimes where the um, signal breaks down between the person that's speaking and the person receiving the message. So there are a whole host of difficulties there around that. But if uh, we invest and get that right, then I think that live court appearances will be uh, less frequent and there will be much more embracing of technology. And so that's probably a good thing that will come out of it with lots of traveling. I'm looking at my practitioner colleague who may speak after me in the criminal area where they are away a lot and traveling a lot all over the country. Yes, Oliver, say to you next. Thank you. Um, well, the biggest change um, in the, the criminal courts, and I'm, I'm talking about the Crown Court uh, from my point of view, is that jury trials just, just aren't happening. I think it was last week that they, um, first started resuming jury trials again and only have had a very limited number of court centres. So um, up here, I think it's Cardiff and uh, Minchell Street. So Liverpool, which is a huge court centre at the moment, not doing trials. Chester, where I operate, not doing trials. In the north of Wales, so Mould and Carnarvon, not doing trials. Um, so that's the, in terms of the question, um, that's the biggest change um, to trials as a result of COVID-19. About 60% of the country, the Crown Court's up and down the country, we're not having trials. Um, moving forward, um, I think that um, some more Crown Court's going to be doing trials from the 8th of June. Certainly that's the, the plan up here. Um, but they're going to be using um, more, more courtrooms. So uh, the jury will be in one courtroom with the barristers and the judge, um, witnesses, especially vulnerable witnesses. And I don't just mean vulnerable um, in terms of children um, or, or disabled witnesses, but of course now witnesses who um, are in the vulnerable category so far as COVID-19 is concerned, so they might be in a different courtroom um, and over the link. So as Barry was just saying, you lose that ability or the jury loses that ability to, um, to see the witness in the witness box, um, to see how they answer the questions, the sort of non-verbal, you know, the body language, which can often be more telling than what they say. 
um, you lose that. Um, I think it's pro probably moving forward. Some jurisdictions will embrace remote working and um, uh, will probably do more of it. But I just don't see how in the, in the criminal courts, when it comes to a trial, when it comes to establishing if someone's guilty or not, uh, when it comes to hearing from witnesses, um, seeing exhibits, um, I, I just don't think you're ever going to be able to do that uh, remotely, or you're not going to be able to do justice to the parties by doing it remotely. And, and so that, that's why, um, you know, there's this backlog now, because um, whereas perhaps in employment tribunals, civil cases, even family cases, um, it's been working rather well. In, in the criminal courts, you, you can't get away from it. You need 12 jurors. Uh, you need the usher to take the exhibit over to the jury. You need the witness in the witness box. Um, so I, I can't, I can't see, I can't see any big changes so far as crime is concerned. Um, I think as soon as we can get back to being in the courtroom and doing what we do, we will. Thank you. Do you have anyone else that would like to add any suggestions to this answer? No. Okay, well, we've gone through a number of the pre-prepared questions now. So at this point, we're going to turn over to you in the audience. So if anyone has any questions, um, I notice a lot of you don't have your video screen on, so you can type a message in the chat at the bottom, or if you'd like to pop your hand up, um, and then I can turn to you for a question that way. So I'll just give you a moment or two if anyone wants to pop the hand up and ask a question. Just jump onto my second screen. Yes, I can see Gemma uh, placing your hand up there. You can, take can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, brilliant, thank you. So you have to forgive me um, if it's already been discussed because I did miss the um, beginning of this meeting. But um, in terms of obviously being self-employed and managing your own finance, alongside that, how would you describe your work-life balance? Do you think it's still quite manageable or are you more lying on the side of if you don't work, you don't get any income? Okay, we, we, we've touched on the subject, but it's a good question, actually. Uh, Kadim, would you like to start with this one? Yeah. Um, Gemma, the, um, the reality is that if you don't work, you don't earn any money in, in, at the bar, essentially. You've got to, to do something with your time, and time management is very important. But you've got to, um, got to earn a living. And it's, um, um, as far as work-life balance is concerned, you work when you get a brief when you first start off uh, in practice. You, you've got to work um, until you've got that case prepared and everything else comes second, usually. Um, and I think um, that's something that we all uh, have experienced where we've started something and we've got holidays booked or some other uh, engagement that evening. Um, you've got to put that aside. But uh, the work that I do tends to be long trials and I tend to prepare well in advance. So even if I had to go and do something else uh, on an evening, I can go and do that and come back to it. So, um, you know, you've got to manage your time. Mm. Good answer. Uh, Benice, would you like to add to that? Well, I have a mix of long and short trials and quite often you have to forgo things that you wanted to do um, I've missed holidays, I've missed um, going for meals, I've missed going around to people's houses because I have trials. But there is nothing worse than I think every practitioner here is the paranoia when you don't have any work in because you think you'll never work again. So try and enjoy when you do get your practice a day off. Enjoy having that time off and not panicking that you haven't got work that day. As a person, I tend to work between the hours of five o'clock in the morning uh, until court time quite regularly, but I go to bed sometimes earlier as well. It can fit in with your lifestyle. You just have to be a, sometimes a bit selfish uh, with other people to say, no, you have to do this work. It has to be done because uh, as I think uh, Oliver or, or uh, Barry already said, you've got to be extremely well prepared when you come to a trial. And there's nothing worse than saying, I wanted that time to go off and do this and I should have prepared. You can't go back. You have to make sure you do it. Mm. Okay. So did you place your hand up then? Yes, I did. Um, my experience, um, and I think it'd be different depending on the area of law you practice as well as what stage of your career you're at. 
Um, early on, I did find myself not turning away work, taking on everything I could, uh, having just come out of law school, um, different stage of life, and um, trying to get the most experience, develop the relationships and links with solicitors. Also, the clerks uh, aren't too happy early on uh, if you're refusing work. Um, I think uh, as you develop uh, a practice, what you tend to do, or some people do, what I've done in any event, is that I set aside the money uh, that I earn and I pay myself a monthly salary. And that's what I'm reliant on. I ensure that I have enough uh, in the account to pay that salary for three to six months and my annual holidays I book maybe because I'm in civil practice and our trials get booked months uh, and months ahead um, usually I'm aware of what's happening in my diary if there's a wedding coming up I can contact my clerks and say take that uh, block that day out if there's a week I need off some holidays um, I can plan around that but again, as I said, that's uh, maybe something peculiar with uh, civil as opposed to crime, because I know crime can be quite haphazard and um, last minute instructions, whereas with civil, it's, uh, it's a little bit more manageable. I don't do uh, crazy hours. I'm, I usually wake up early. Uh, I start my working day around 7 a.m., but unless... Uh, a trials overrunning for whatever reason. I rarely work beyond five o'clock. Barry? Yeah, can I just add to that? I just think in my practice, it, it's feast or famine uh, sometimes. So for example, you can think, well, I'm very quiet. There's nothing coming in. And then suddenly you're deluged with a number of requests, a number of bookings. They're all very last minute sometimes, but also you get instructions I find sometimes really late from the instruction solicitors on the basis that they don't have to pay you the brief fee until such time as your clerk or you receive the instructions and so they leave it to the last minute and often as one of our colleagues has already said you are working the whole damn weekend sometimes because once you accept the brief you're accepting responsibility to turn up on the Monday for example and do the case and be fully prepared so a weekend that you had planned when papers come in on a Friday or a Thursday evening is completely gone because once you take it on you're taking it on to do it to the best of your ability so sometimes as right as was rightly said plans that you had do have to go out of the window so one thing is you have to be flexible if you want to keep that work do that work and do a good job and the other is that you have to be quite self-disciplined as well around the time management that was mentioned earlier because you have to be quite strict um, to say I'm going to do that and then I'm going to have a break I'm going to go out for a walk I'm going to do whatever I am this lockdown is a really good example of, of me trying to stick to a good routine so getting up early doing the stuff I need to do going out doing the exercise coming back doing a bit more and it depends on your family commitments and your day generally but you've got to you've got to be quite disciplined and you've got to work it around all of those other things that you need to do okay thank you barry and um, just turning to the chat now i can see that we've had a few um questions come through and um, so i think we had um carrie who said uh, that they have a question on specialization i uh, don't know if carrie would like to ask the question hi hello um so yeah, just wondering, when it comes to specialising, if you know that you want to specialise in a specific area, can you only specialise in the one area? Are there areas that complement each other better? Um, do any of you specialise in like multiple areas? Well, do we have any mixed or common law practitioners? Jack has his hand up. Um, yeah, well, I, I did a general criminal pupillage and my uh, chambers really only does crime and family, but I started picking up elements of civil law. Um, even within a particular area you can also acquire specializations and I think sometimes it's worth bearing in mind not trying to specialize too early trying to keep an open mind about things um, example in my own practice I was I, I, a few years ago now briefed on a magistrate's court case involving um, animal cruelty and that then led to three or four bookings in my diary of animal welfare cases because my clerks with me having done that one case decided i was all automatically the go-to person on that within chambers 
Uh, and so never something I, I anticipated, wasn't something I was after. Sometimes these sorts of things can just happen in terms of specialization. So I would sort of say, if you have a particular area of law in mind, obviously, and that's all you want to do, go for it, 100%. But I would also keep open, an open mind as to other areas that you may fall into, other aspects of it. And I think certainly at a uh, university stage, it's important to experience a number of different areas because ultimately when you go into an interview and they say, well, why do you want to specialise in that? The best answer is because I've tried X, Y, Z, and this is the only thing that I find fascinating or interesting or I really want to do. So that would be the advice I'd give you on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And um, do we have anyone else that would like to add anything at all? Before we turn to the next question? No? Okay. Are we, our next question. Oh, Oliver. <laughs> yes, I'll hand over to you now. All I was, all I was going to say is um, you might have sort of preconceived ideas about. Um, what a practice area will be like. So you might, for example, say, well, um, I know someone who does employment law or I've, I've spent some time doing work experience and the employment law firm, that's what I want to do. Um, my advice would be, um, be as open-minded as you can. Um, if you're going to do a pupillage, um, that's, a, that's a common law pupillage, try a bit of everything. So before I decided to specialize in crime, uh, I did civil law, a, a bit of PI, clinic, employment, family, and very quickly realized that crime was, was where I wanted to be. So, um, and, and also there's a big difference between academic law and, and law in practice. So if you, if you did something at university and you didn't particularly like it, don't assume it's like that in practice. You know, have a bit of a taste, go and do some work experience, ask practitioners. Um, because especially these days, I think you've got to be, um, you've got to be adaptable. Um, so, you know, if, if, if you specialize in, in an area of law that dries up or the government changed the way you're paid or, or something like that, um, if that's the only thing you can do, the only thing you've been doing for 10 years, then you're going to be snookered, aren't you? So um, going, going forward to the bar now, I'd say just try and have a couple of, of specialisms rather than, than, than one. Um, so if you do crime, maybe look at doing um, regulatory work as well, because um, that sits nicely with crime. Um, but, but certainly, you know, try and get as much experience as you can of lots of different practice areas um, before you, you kind of fix on one of them. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Okay. Pass to Kadim next. I think you had your hand up as well. Can I just say that um, when I started uh, my pupillage, I went to a, I, I did a chancery pupillage, which is a real commercial end. Um, and I started that. And then within about nine, 12 months, um, I, I was offered a, um, a brief in a criminal case. Um, in, in the days when I did my pupillage, there was no um, pupillage awards. You were living off your, whatever you could, you could save or get a loan. Uh, and uh, I did that case and then it, um, did, I did a complete U-turn in the work that I used to do. I still do some civil work, which has been very handy, but you just don't know where your career is gonna go because it's, um, it's case by case development. Every barrister, every person that's on this, um, you know, on this Zoom meeting will tell you that um, their specialization is when they get instructed on a case, they become a, almost a specialist in that area. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll turn to the next question now, and this is from Alan Robertshaw. If you'd like to take yourself off mute to ask the question. Oh, hi, yes. Um, I'm just gonna chip in because somebody is a bit long in the tooth for this. There are two things I wanted to mention. Um, one was, I'm from a sort of non-traditional background, sort of first person to go to university, former polytechnic and things. And I think one thing that can be an issue is imposter syndrome. And I would say, never let that get to you. You know, you are as good as everybody. You're as good as you are good. And once you've established yourself, to be perfectly frank, very few people care about your background. Solicitors care about results. And also to follow on from the question about, um, 
specialisations. Another thing I would say is once you get your feet under the table in chambers and you're all nervous and you're being sent off to ice stations, Beaver Magistrates Court, never say, say yes to every opportunity thrown at you. Uh, so you'll fake it till you make it. My particular career, I started out doing the traditional baby barristering thing, the criminal work and you know all that, all that sort of thing. Um, and on two occasions, one day some more senior person in chamber said, could I cover a court martial preliminary hearing for them? And I said, of course. I had no idea, couldn't even work out where Bulford Camp was, but sort of, you know, this is before Google, but did a little bit of reading in the library. And within a year, literally all of a sudden I had a, a military law practice. And similarly, somebody asked me to cover a night shift at the, um, at the Sun at News International to do some uh, night lawyering, you know, pre-publication advice. And again, I said yes to that. Um, dug out Jeffrey Robertson's book and <laughs> thumbed through that. And again, very, very shortly. And that's how I ended up with a career. And the, to go back to the question, which is a very good question about specialisation, you don't necessarily have to, I would suggest, tie yourself into one area and related areas you could have and that's the great joy of this job you can end up having interest in all sorts of weird and very very diverse areas so i end up at the bar i end up doing a decade of military law and media law in one case actually combined the two which is rather strange and now for bizarre reason i do animal rights and art law which are very disparate things although again there is some sort of tying together so that's just my thing what i would say is with that if there's any one golden rule to the bar is don't tie yourself into too narrow a constraint. If you've got a career plan, fantastic. But you know, they also, you know, when men make plans, I'll alas, maybe just go with the flow a little bit and see where things take you. Take a Taoist approach. But the one thing I would recommend to everybody is seize every single opportunity. If you try a case and you don't like it, fantastic. You, you, you now know that's not something for you. But you never really know what you may enjoy and also what you might be good at. So that's one thing I would say is don't paint yourself in 20 corners uh, than you have to. So that's my contribution. <laughs> and also in terms of uh, remote working, I'm currently, it's my life now, I'm walking through the lanes doing 20 mile walks, doing every conference and hearing by Zoom or telephone. And it's a, it's, it's a great way of living. <laughs> so I hope this is the future of the bar. Excellent. Thanks for your input, Alan. I should add that Alan is a barrister of 24 years call as well. Um, so there's quite a lot of experience, uh, a lot of um, sort of knowledge that he can add there. Um, so thank you for your input there, Alan. It's much appreciated. Well, experience anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. <laughs> no, but, but thank you. That, that was much appreciated. Um, okay, so I think what we'll do is we've got time for a couple more questions. So I'm just going through the list that we've received here. Um, quite a good one here. Um, Quite often a question on pupillage application forms is, why do you want to be a barrister? Has anyone got any advice on how to deal with that question and not be too formulaic? Uh, I'll turn to Jack first. I was probably the, la the last person on this list to write that answer, so it's, it's a difficult one. Um, you've got to bear in mind that every single application, Chambers will receive hundreds of applications applications and that's why it is important to avoid the formulaic answers. Um, I think the main reason or the main thing that I would advise you to do if you're looking to, for some assistance in that answer is to go and do mini pupillages, do uh, things like mooting, do uh, volunteering advice, uh, things of that nature so you can experience what it is actually like to do the job or at least aspects of it because then you can add your own authenticity to that answer rather than simply just parroting back oh because i like doing x y and z oh, i want to be a, a criminal practitioner whatever it's better to add yourself into that and to give an honest answer rather than to give a formulaic answer so try and get as much experience as you can as much relevant stuff um, that will give you something to put in that answer would be my advice. Denise? Tell them why you want to be a barrister. If it's because your parents want you to be, maybe it's not the right career for you anyway. But if it's because there's something in you that wants you to be a barrister, that will make you succeed anyway. And it'll be more interesting for any panel to consider your answer. And it will probably start an, uh, a discussion 
uh, within the panel and you might touch on things that other people uh, have felt as well. Thank you. Um, do we have any other suggestions from the panel? Saeed? Well, I would say it's, um, it has to be genuine, um, similar to what Jack and Benice have said. It's a very bespoke personal answer, uh, not one that someone else can give you. A bit of advice I received uh, earlier on in my career, um, before I had to uh, answer these questions in an interview, was that sit down, make a note of your reasons. So if you're answering that question personally, number of bullet points, three or four person to you. I appreciate that going, going into uh, um, there's a fine line on how um, far you want to go with that, but it does need to demonstrate your desired determination and passion. If, for example, uh, it's not something you can only uh, justify and explain, it will get ripped apart within an interview, whether directly or indirectly uh, afterwards when they decide whether to offer you a clip or not. It does have to be genuine. You can't make this one up. You're talking to uh, professionals who analyze and critique on a daily basis. And um, that is definitely one answer they're going to pay particular interest to. So. Um, yeah, find your reason. You should, um, as Benith just said, you should really know why you're doing it. And um, those reasons should be cogent and justifiable. Excellent. I think we have a follow-up question now, and I hope I pronounced this correctly, from Coyote. Hello, thank you very much for, for the answers given so far. So, um, I find that at this stage, I'm a student, and at this stage, I don't quite have um particular practice areas in mind i i, I prefer to be more open-minded at this stage but Good. in trying to apply for interviews or for scholarships for example at the interview stage you would have to to demonstrate that you you have definite interests in particular practice areas so if you're trying to be open-minded how do you handle such a situation okay and um, do we have any uh, Benice? Yeah, do so many people are just, you don't have to uh, be at any stage to do those and you might just find something that you like and then at least you can talk in your interview about experiences you've had, the live experiences you've had with another barrister. Brilliant advice. Said? It's the suggestions this evening that you need to be open, uh, if you can look at it as a two-pronged approach. So first of all, uh, you should have some inclination as to which area of practice you want to go into. Um, the suggestion from what I understand the other practitioners and from myself is that despite having an inclination, an idea of which area you want to go into, don't be closed exclusively to that. For example, if opportunities do come up, um, there's a late return in chambers, clerk asks you, be open to it. Um, if your chambers does other work, for example, if you go into crime and they do family and employment, be open to that. Try it, even if it's to confirm that you don't want to touch it ever again. I think the other thing that I would add to that as well is try some experience in a solicitor's firm, in particular areas that you may or may not be interested in, um, for a number of reasons. A, you can show to chambers why you want to be a barrister rather than a solicitor. Also, you'll get to see the practical side of that area of law as well. So you'll understand how the solicitors operate, the pressures that they're under, because that's always helpful. Um, if you enter into chambers, you'll understand the way in which that area of law is funded and how the solicitors are dealing with it. So I think that that's a good way of getting practical experience and showing to the chambers that you've really thought through um, why it is that you've come to a, a decision on a certain area of law. Okay. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience at all? See if anyone else has the hand up. I'll just check if there are any more questions in the chat. Okay, uh, another question that we've had 
is uh, what is one thing that you would tell your younger self, for example, advice, tips, or any lessons learned along the years? Uh, Kadeem, would you like to start with this one? Well, I could probably write a book on it, I think. <laughs> but um, I think I think the biggest thing that um, when you when you're looking back and you think, well, I should have I should have done this or I should have done that, but I think when when you add up all the things that you've done, you probably won't want to change anything because of the fact that what you have done and what you've learned in, in, in all the time that you've been practicing is that it makes you a, a better individual. The fact that you've made mistakes uh, and the like, I think you've got to go through those. Um, and I don't think I've, I have any regrets as far as the practice that I um, do. I, if I was in commercial law, um, you know, I won't need to worry about COVID-19 or anything else. But um, because being a criminal practitioner, it's um, um, you're virtually uh, not earning any any real money now. Um, but you've got to be passionate about what you want to do and um, stick with um, what it is that you want as a long term. You can't really plan your career um, because you do one case at a time. Um, do we have anyone else that would like to add to that? Oliver? Yeah, just looking back, I mean, I don't regret my career choice. I don't regret sort of where I am now. Um, one thing I would change is I didn't apply for any grants or sponsorship when I was um, coming to the, the end of my law degree or before going to the school. Um, because I, I can hear birds, <laughs> so it's a bit distracting. Um, I think Alan, has Alan got his mic um, open? <laughs> um, he hasn't. Okay. Uh, the, the, yeah, the one, the one thing I would say is um, apply for grants, apply for sponsorship. You don't have to be uh, an Oxbridge uh, graduate to, to get them. And I assumed you did. Uh, and then when I was in the robing room, uh, I spoke to, to others who um, had, you know, a, a good degree from a, from a well-respected university, not Oxford or Cambridge, um, and they'd been given £5,000, you know, to, to help them in, in, uh, in, in those early years. Uh, and I kicked myself because I thought, well, I, sh I should have applied for that. So apply, what I will say, th th those of you who are coming to the bar, you know, pennies are tight, you're looking for having to borrow lots of money, um, apply for all the grants and sponsorship you can because worst thing is they can say no but if you don't apply you'll, you'll never know and um, don't, don't doubt yourself because I did um, and you know I, I look back now and think yeah I should have should have applied so apply for everything. Brilliant. Good advice there. We, we've got time for one more question very quickly and then we'll turn to all of our panellists for a little snippet of advice just at the end and the last question um, relates to mooting um, so particular problem is re responding to judicial intervention. Um, do we have any advice from our panellists on how to respond um, to judges? Jack? Um, well, the first thing I would do is, is look at your preparation, um, because what you should be looking whenever you're preparing a case, whether it be for a moot or for um, a, an actual case in practice, is look at the other side of the argument, look at the other side of the coin. And those are the sorts of questions that the judge is probably going to put to you when they're intervening. So if you've thought about those and you've thought of answers for them, you're more better prepared and you're ready to deal with those judicial interventions. The other bit of advice I would give is if, if you get a question out of left field, um, try and take your time. So pause, take a breath, have a think, you don't have to respond um, in a snap decision. No judge is going to criticise you for taking a moment to collect your thoughts and then answer the question properly. So I think it's always worth taking your time, taking a breath and just focusing on the actual question you're being asked and trying to think of the best answer. Um, th that would be the two pieces of advice I would give you. Brilliant. Uh, Kadeem, would you like to? Uh... Um, I mean, Jack. Jack is, um, you know, he's um, hit it on the head. Uh, preparation is very important. But um, uh, one of the things that I did when I um, was was at bar school and 
um, in a temple was quite good at it, was do a lot of debating because debating helps you think on your feet and um, um, being able to, to respond to, to something that's been said. Um, so that's what I would uh, say. Fantastic. I think Alan wanted to chip in as well with an answer. Do you want to um, add something to that, Alan? Oh, I think you'll need to unmute the microphone. Yes, there we go. So, yeah, um, just to chip in from some real world experience, preparation is incredibly important and you need to know the facts and the law and every aspect of your case. But what I would say is don't be too much of a slave to your notes or your preparation. If the judge asks you a specific question, now it might be you've got a brilliantly formulated argument and you want to keep to that um, structure. So you might say something like, that's an excellent point, Your Honour, I'll be moving on to that shortly. However, if a judge has asked you a question, that means that's something that's important to him or her. So be prepared to go off piece and go off script and deal with that question because you don't be too formulaic. Dealing with the judiciary, it's a two-way thing. It's a conversation. It's a dialogue. Uh, and you need to be prepared for that because, you know, if you just want to lay out your argument, you've done that in your skeleton argument. So what I would say is if a judge is asking you a question, that's because they think that's important to your case and they're giving you hints as to what they want to hear about to sort of make the best case and your best argument. So listen, you can pause. No, there's that weird time dilation effect in court where everything, you know, you're panicking, your heart's racing. But pause, just say, that's an excellent point. I have some material here on that. Move down, use your notes, use your skeleton argument and move on to that point. But then almost like an old sort of ghost of routine, be able to move back. Don't lose your thread and miss out your other fantastic points. But yeah, um, listen to what the judges tell you because it might well be that they agree with you with lots of points and you're pushing it against an open door. So use the feedback and the information from the judges. Great. So that's Thank my you. point. Excellent. Great advice there. Um, do we have any uh, final points on judicial intervention? Oliver? Just, just um, picking up on what, what Alan said, really. Um, sometimes you'll, you'll go in front of a judge and, and they've kind of prejudged the argument, especially in the Crown Court. You might be making an application to dismiss. They've had a quick look at the police summary. Of course, the police have written the police summary. So it's very prosecution um, biased. And um, the judge might say, to you, you know, are you, are you really going to argue that? Um, don't just don't just kind of roll over and say, oh, OK, um, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, if you think you've got a good point, be tenacious and, and say to the judge, this is something I often say when, when judges say this to me, is, w w will your honour just allow me to develop the point? And, um, and then every judge will then say, well, yeah, go on then. And then you can actually explain to them why this isn't a dud point. Um, and of course, if you've got some good points and they're not covered in the police summary or the police summary is very, um, um, you know, one-sided, it gives you a chance to then um, present present your side and, and quite often they'll, uh, they'll then think it's a good point and, and come down on your side. So ne never just roll over, be, be tenacious, but, but obviously polite in the way you, you put it across. Excellent. Uh, any final comments from anyone else on judicial intervention? Okay, um, so we're, we've come to half eight now, so the uh, meeting's about to end shortly. Um, but just before we finish, I'd like to turn to each of our panellists just for a 30-second snippet of information, last thing to take away. Um, so I'd like to begin with uh, with Oliver. Great, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel, I feel like I'm in a few pleasure interview now. <laughs> um, I'm sim simply working my way around the screen. Cool. Um, personally, I... I I think it's a massive privilege to be able to stand up in court um, and represent someone who um, hasn't perhaps the, um, the, the means, the education, um, they're not articulate, you know, they, they, they don't understand the process, they're intimidated by it all, and they're putting all that trust in you to stand up and advance their case in the best, best way you can. Um, I, I can't think of anything better really, or, or indeed, you know, a job that that, that brings much more responsibility than, than that. And, you yeah, know, that's the point. Your, your journey through university and then bar school, um, you're picking up the skills, obviously the, the knowledge at university, but then at bar school, 
um, you know, power of persuasion, how to structure an argument, um, and you're putting all that together to, to represent someone. Um, in terms of the job, why I love it so much, well, no two days are the same, no two cases are the same, no two clients are the same. They all have their own idiosyncrasies. No two witnesses are the same. You might ask a question in one trial, get the answer you want, ask it in another trial, and get something totally different. So you've always got to be prepared to listen um, and adapt. Um, but no two days are the same. Um, and at nine to five, it's not, it, it, is, a, it is a vocation. Um, and if that's what you want, then, then it is definitely the job for you. Brilliant. Great words there. Uh, Jack, do you have any uh, final words of wisdom? Uh, yeah, well, I agree entirely with everything Oliver's just said. Um, but I've tried to think of the, the, uh, something a bit practical. Um, the best piece of practical advice I was given when I was in pupillage is when you're watching a case, so this could apply to whether you're going into Crown Court on a visit, whether you're in a mini pupillage, whether you're in pupillage yourself the main thing to focus on or the thing that you need to pay attention to is the small practical details so for example um how do you call a witness so what sort of steps should you go through to do that um how do you address certain judges whether they're a magistrate or a judge or a high court judge um and pay attention to how for example um more senior barristers deal with uh, judicial interventions because those are the key things that will then hold you in good stead when you're actually in the hot seat yourself and you have to deal with these things the last thing you want to do is to forget something basic and stupid uh, like how to call a witness to give evidence so that would be the the, the practical tip i would give brilliant great advice there Bernice, any final words for the students um two things if you win a case you're not the best barrister in the world you lose a case you're not the worst barrister in the world some things are out of your control just try as hard as you can for your client and probably the most important point that you should uh, always uh, consider for every time you're in the crown court and probably the magistrate's court or anybody else in in courts be nice to the usher they talk to the judge and they can make you last in in the list of trials that are going to be heard that day brilliant great practical advice there Kadim, any final words um some practical tips do um, quite a few mini pupillages uh, and don't be um, put off by the fact that you don't um, um, get mini pupillages. And if you don't, you can always email me and I'll, uh, I'll offer you one. But um, write articles, uh, do something that um, there's lots of um, uh, material out there that you can write on at the moment. Uh, and also do something um, that's going to help you on your destination. Do some voluntary work. Uh, do all the things that that you think that might help you along the way. It doesn't have to be law related. All right. Excellent. And then finally, we'll turn to Saeed. I would say is it's your journey. Um, it's personal to you with determination, with ambition, and with a sense of dedication, uh, you can get there. Don't be disheartened, keep at it. The bar has opened up a lot more, uh, even from the time when I was uh, looking to join and um, having joined, barristers are a friendly bunch. As um, Kadim has very kindly offered uh, a mini pupilid, just email him, you'll find other barristers who are also willing and able to help. If your academic grades you're not too happy with. There are other ways to bolster that uh, with work experience, with uh, other skills and experiences. I'd say just keep at it. Thank you. Great advice there from all of our panelists. So uh, this brings us to the end of our first Q&A session. I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of our panelists for giving up their time tonight to help you. Uh, thank you to Sonny for helping me to organise this series of events. Um, this is the first in our series of four events. The next one is a week today and it will be with a panel of solicitors. So some of you may well be signed up for that. If anyone's interested in that, you can uh, certainly sign up for that. And um, if you keep an eye on our social media, you'll be able to keep it up to date with all of the latest Q&A sessions that we're running. We're hoping to put on a few more fun events um, online in the coming weeks afterwards. So keep an eye on that. 
and of course keep an eye on the website for any details of the national speed routing competition as well and tonight's event has been sponsored by publicspeakingtuition.com and um, so once again i'd just like to thank everyone for uh, turning up tonight and if anyone has any feedback i'll be um, sending an email out afterwards and i'd be grateful for any feedback so uh, thank you and i hope to see you again soon